Oncology, Skin Cancer, and Sarcomas, presented by Dr. Aaron Shavinsky. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Shavinsky. Thank you all, and uh, let me take the opportunity to wish you all good luck. I am sure that everybody in this room will pass, or I will take it personally. <laughs> now, the bottom you see is my email. That's my personal email. I would love to hear from you guys and, and ladies. Uh, if uh, there are any questions that you have about this or anything else, I'll, I'm always happy to give an opinion, right or wrong. Uh, but I would also like to know, after you take your exams, if there are any areas uh, that you felt were either particularly well covered or, more importantly, weren't particularly well covered. Uh, if you could let me know or let Michael know, um, certainly in the areas that I taught, but in any of the areas, if you felt that there was a real gap, uh, that there were some areas that you thought weren't clear or that the information wasn't good, please fill out your evaluations. They take them very seriously. I do a lot with, with helping to develop the curriculum in addition to the lectures that I give. So if there are areas or things that you feel that need more emphasis or less emphasis, all, the, your, all your comments are taken very, very seriously. So I just want you to know that because everybody's goal here is to give you what you need in order to prepare to take the boards, particularly for those who are practicing in areas that are really siloed, like cardiac surgery, for example, or doing breast, and you're not really being exposed to some of the other areas. This is really important for us to know if we're not getting to you what you need to know. So th with that being said, uh, and wishing you all good luck, this is my last talk for you for this go-round. Uh, and this will be on a, sort of a hodgepodge of different things, things that really aren't covered in many of the other lectures. So we're going to talk about skin cancers and melanomas and sarcomas. But we're also going to talk a little bit about surgical oncology, a little bit about chemotherapy, a little bit about radiation therapy and how it works, and things that you might need to know for the exam or it might be just interesting for you to know in general. Uh, and again, nothing new with my disclosures. So this will be broken up into the following sections. We're going to talk about both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers, sarcomas, the management of gist tumors. Now, were gist tumors covered during your gastric lecture? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit, uh, I'll do a talk a little bit about that as well, hopefully not contradict anything that uh, they said. And then a little bit about uh, surgical oncology or oncology. So... First question is, which of the following are associated with an increased risk of malignant melanoma? More than three blistering sunburns as a youngster. Blonde or red hair, which burns easily. Blonde or red hair with fair skin, which burns easily. History of multiple dysplastic nevi. Outdoor jobs for several years as a teenager, or all of the above. And, of course, the answer is all of the above. So, incidence of melanoma, slightly on the rise, uh, increasing particularly in uh, the Caucasian population. Mortality, about flat. Increased incidence of melanoma, 619% between 1950 and 2000. And that's for a number of reasons. One... Uh, during the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, uh, we gained, became progressively less clothed at the beaches, and uh, it was felt to be healthy to get out in the sun, get up on the roof, slather on the baby oil, get the sun reflector, and really burn to a crisp. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we're paying the price now two or three decades later, where now we're taking our grandkids for those of you who have them, and dipping them in, uh, in sunscreen before taking them out, wrapped up like a, uh, an Egyptian sarcophagus. <laughs> but such is life. So, uh, 73,800 new cases of melanoma in 2015, roughly 10,000 deaths. 
increased from 1 in 1500 in 1935 to about 1 in 74 today, crosses race and gender lines, the highest incidence is in white males. And again, the highest geographic incidence in the U.S. is in the area, what's called the Sun Belt, going from about the coast of Virginia across Florida and down across the lower part of the United States through Louisiana, across the area near the coast. And in the world, the highest incidence are where you take white people and put them into subtropical locations, such as in South Africa and Australia, uh, where they have the highest worldwide incidence of melanoma. So... It's the highest number of productive years lost, more than breast, lung, and colorectal. Most patients are diagnosed early. African Americans tend to have a much later diagnosis because melanoma isn't really considered in many of them. The relative survival is on the rise due to early diagnosis, and a recent decrease in melanoma is noted in the uh, black population. So who is at risk? Well, there's a familial history of malignant melanoma. It's also based on skin color and skin type. The environmental risks, and, and I'd probably put a little star on this page because this one comes up from time to time. Uh, more than three blistering sunburns, age 20, before age 20, outdoor summer jobs, the use of sun lamps and tanning, and really from a public health perspective, uh, beyond smoking, the second most common preventable cause of cancer is the use of sun tanning beds. Uh, it is really uh, abysmal to think that we're purposely subjecting ourselves, and particularly younger adults, are subjecting themselves to such an increased cancer risk. Um, other factors, skin lesions like actinic keratosis, freckling of the back, large number of normal atypical congenital or giant nevi. There's a very high risk of skin cancers both melanoma and non-melanoma in patients who are immune suppressed or who are on immune suppressive drugs, such as after organ transplant or for treatment of myeloproliferative disorders, leukemias, lymphomas, survivors of bone marrow transplant, they have a very, very high incidence of skin cancer. And each of these is additive. So here's our prototypical melanoma patient. Red hair, blue eyes, many freckles, lots of marks on the back. And this slide is uh, mentioned just to be condemned. There is absolutely no reasonable benefit or reason to do this, um, particularly when there are spray tans available. There's just no reason for this. Not that I personally know about that. <laughs> My former partner sitting in the back row, uh, and I'm not going to tell her not to say anything. <laughs> so, the ABCDs of melanoma diagnosis, asymmetry, one half of the lesion is shaped differently than the other, border irregularity, the border is irregular, blurred, or ragged, color, inconsistent pigmentation with shades of brown, black, or blue, or diameter, greater than six millimeters or a progressive change in size, or E, evolution. History of change in the lesion, bleeding, itching, or disappearing. So somebody comes in to see you and says, I had a very large dark spot that went away. That's not a good sign, unless it was chocolate. <laughs> but otherwise, it's not a good sign. So the types of melanoma, Superficial spreading about 70%, 60 to 70%. Flat during their early phase with notching and scalloping. Nodular melanomas, darker and thicker. Uh, remember that a certain percentage will be amelanotic, meaning they may be pink, not dark in color. So pink papules have to be looked at as well because there is an incident of amelanotic melanomas. Lentigos, which are, tend to be in the head and neck in elderly people. Acrolentiginous, which tends to be on the hands and feet uh, or under the fingernails, and subungual melanomas. They're more common in the Asians and blacks, relatively speaking. Soles and palms beneath nail beds. Uh, and then the desmoplastic, which tends to be more locally aggressive, but less systemically aggressive. So, run through a couple of pictures of melanoma. 
Here, what's this? This isn't symmetrical. It's not regular. It's got irregular borders, irregular pigmentation. Here's one that's ulcerated. Here's one that's got areas of regression in the middle, different variegated color. This is a nodular melanoma on somebody's extremity. Here you see a superficial spreading melanoma with a nodular growth phase. And here you see a lentigo with a nodular growth phase. And this is the prototypical melanoma. If they're going to give you a picture on an exam, probably going to look something like that. Uh, irregularly shaped, uh, irregularly pigmented. And of course, any lesion, any pigmented lesion on the hands or the feet is suspect and should be biopsied. Period, 100%, end of discussion. Anything under the nail, anything on the hands, anything on the feet, you need to be concerned. So, how do you make the diagnosis? Well, it's all by histology, uh, excisional biopsies for small lesions, punch biopsies or incisional biopsies for larger lesions. If they're small, you can excise them with a narrow margin. If they're large, you can do a punch biopsy or an incisional biopsy. You do not want to do a shave biopsy because the shave biopsy may screw up the microstaging. Uh, you want to determine the depth and level of invasion. You want to identify the prognostic factors of the primary lesion, which are going to help you to decide how to best treat this. And the things that we want to know, very important, what's the depth? Is it ulcerated? Is there any sign of regression? What's the mitotic rate? Those are the four factors that are going to help you to decide how much of the melanoma you need to take out and whether or not you need to do more than just take care of it locally. So, which of the following is not included in the AJCC staging of melanoma? Breslau level, level of invasion, the presence of ulceration, the presence of regression, lymph node metastases, or the presence of satellite or in-transit lesions. <clears throat> You're talking about treatment or diagnosis? We're getting to treatment. We're going to, we're going to cover that very succinctly and very extensively because that's one of the key points of this, of this is how, what do you do when you have the information? So we'll get to that. So the answer is... Uh, Breslau level, ulceration, lymph node metastases, and satellite lesions are all part of the staging, but regression, for whatever reason, is not. It is not part of the staging. So, this is the new AJCC7 staging. Uh, T size on the right and on the left. It should be reversed, but I'll take care of that on the next iteration of the slides. Um, so T1 is less than a millimeter, T2 1 to 2 millimeters, T3 2 to 4, T4 over 4, A no ulceration, B with ulceration, and then the end stage, no METs, 1 positive, 2 to 3 positive, 4 positive, A clinically occult, B clinically apparent, or C in transit. Now these are depth, not diameter. Depth. Depth of invasion. Diameter means absolutely nothing except if you're a plastic surgeon, then you can bill for it. <laughs> um, so, again, just a summary of the staging, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Again, the Clark level comes into that a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's not used really for anything much anymore, but I mention it so you'll know Clark level one is epidermal, Clark level two into the papillary dermis, Clark level three abuts the reticular dermis, level four into the reticular dermis, and level five into the subcutaneous tissue. And really, this is the Breslau level. This is the, where all the money is today, the thickness. And zero to one, one to two, two to four, greater than four. Really, it's three groups. When you look at treatment, it's 
Well, it's, it's, it's in situ, less than one, one to four, or greater than four. It's how we group them for treatment. So what are the prognostic factors? Depth of invasion, presence or absence of ulceration, male sex, we tend to have worse melanomas, trunk, head, neck, location, and age. Mortality increases with increasing age as opposed to most cancers where the mortality decreases with increasing age. And lymph node metastases are higher in younger patients. The nodular subtype and higher mitotic rate. So these are, this is something you probably want to just put a little mark on the page. These are the factors which, which would determine which of the melanomas are more, uh, more, in, more aggressive. So surgical treatment. So you have a 33-year-old woman who's three years out from a wide excision sentinel node biopsy for a 2.3 millimeter nodular melanoma of the post-auricular area. She presents with a mass adjacent to the parotid gland and an FNA a diagnosis metastatic melanoma involving a lymph node. After staging evaluation has determined that there is no evidence of distant metastatic disease, the next step would be radiation therapy to the neck, radical neck dissection and superficial parotidectomy, the same with one month of high dose and 11 months of low dose interferon, superficial parotidectomy including the positive node or chemotherapy using the Dartmouth protocol. It can't all be easy. And the answer is C, radical neck dissection, superficial parotidectomy, one month of high dose and 11 months of low dose interferon. And we'll get to that as we go along in our lecture. So when I trained in the era of giants, when the patients came by horse and buggy to the hospital, everybody with a melanoma got a five centimeter excision 100% of the time, and many got a radical lymphadenectomy as well depending on which part of the country you practice. But that's changed significantly and probably for the better because that was all based on a study in the 1900s where they looked at satellite lesions from a melanoma in the groin and decided that five centimeters is probably enough. So these are the trials that were done subsequent to that that were really are forming the basis of what we do now for melanoma. So the first was the World Health Organization melanoma trial, looking at tumors under two millimeters, one versus three centimeter margin. The US intergroup melanoma trial, one to four millimeters, two versus four centimeters. The French trial, the Swedish trial, and the UK melanoma trial. But these two in particular have formed the basis for which all of our melanoma treatment currently is based. It's on the U.S. intergroup melanoma trial and the WHO melanoma trial uh, that we base our therapy. So this is the answer to your question. This is what you do for melanoma. If it's an in situ melanoma, you take a five millimeter margin. If it's under a millimeter, or equal to a millimeter, you take a one centimeter margin, and for everything else, you take a two centimeter margin. This is the answer, 100%, any question, except asterisk. You can modify your margins because of areas of anatomic or cosmetic concern, face, hands, feet, but under no circumstance, it should be under a centimeter. For clinically de ill-defined lesions, you really want to get a po a, an intraoperative biopsy to confirm that you've gotten the entire lesion out. But if you remember this chart, uh, in situ, half a centimeter, less than, well, less than or equal to a millimeter, one centimeter, or two centimeters for everything else, that'll answer your questions. It'll be right on the exam. Melanoma of the digits, very complex problem. Subungual and digital melanomas are often ignored and diagnosed at a later stage. They may occur in darker skinned individuals, uh, particularly under the fingernails in acrolentigenous. 
You may get a Hutchinson sign, which is a pigment change of the cuticle, and the prognosis is worse due to advanced stage of diagnosis. So if you have somebody with a dark spot under their nail and you don't know whether it's due to the fact that they hit themselves with a hammer or not, how do you manage that? Because you can't really biopsy it really well under the nail without taking the nail off. So if you wait a week or two and you see that it's moving out down the nail, it's not a melanoma. But on the other hand, if it stays in the same place, then you got to do something. So the treatment is controversial for digital melanoma. The standard answer is amputation, at least one joint proximal to the tumor, along with a sentinel node biopsy, even for in situ lesions. And I will tell you that many people, particularly for earlier stage tumors, will try to resect and skin graft or do a little flap and not amputate the lesion. So it's not generally accepted, but this is the standard guideline, at least for the purpose of the, the exam. And you try to do things simply. Direct closure, local flap, skin graft, distant flap. In most cases, for most melanomas, you should be able to reconstruct them at the same sitting. As far as lymphatic mapping, remember we said that for breast cancer, if you had cells in the lymph node, but they were less than 0.2 millimeters, that wasn't considered a positive lymph node? We said that earlier, right? That doesn't apply to melanoma. Any single cell that stains positively as a melanoma is considered a positive node. So for melanoma, any cell in the lymph node is positive. It doesn't matter how many there are. It's a different system. So lymphatic metastases from the tumor spread through afferent channel to a sentinel node, which is the first node in the chain. These are immunosuppressed and proven to be sites of early metastasis. So remember we said in breast that, hey, if you have only one or two lymph nodes and it's not so bad, and, you know, they're going to get radiation anyway, don't bother doing anything more. That doesn't apply to melanoma, although it's changing. But right now, any positive melanoma requires a lymph node dissection of the involved basin. Head, neck, radical neck dissection, axillary, inguinal. Any positive node. But that's, that may be changing over the next, time, next year or two. So these are SAPI's lines, and they determine where the lymph node drainage should be. Remember that for breast, it always goes to the axilla, just essentially always. But for melanoma, particularly truncal melanoma, you may have multiple sites of drainage. You have a melanoma around the umbilicus, it could potentially drain to four sites, both axilla, both groin, or any combination of that. So they all need to get preoperative lymphocentigraphy at the day of injection prior to deciding which lymph node basin you need to biopsy. Uh, and if it goes to multiple basins, then you need to biopsy lymph nodes in multiple areas. Plus there are areas of non-anatomic drainage. I've had lesions drain to popliteal nodes, to epitrochlear nodes, to supraclavicular nodes, to nodes uh, in the middle of the trapezius where there shouldn't be a lymph node, but there is. So this is a lot more complex and you need to have cooperation from your nuclear medicine department. Now, typically those on the extremity will go to the axilla or the groin. On the trunk will go either up or down, but sometimes both, depending on if you're on the right side, the left side, or in the middle. And here we see a patient just, here's your arm over the head, injection site, axillary node, probing, injecting with blue dye if you choose to do so, finding the blue node, finding the blue lymphatic, going to the blue node, and then removing the lymph node with a melanoma implant in the subcapsular area. So injection of radiocolloid and vital blue dye improves the accuracy. Identification of the sentinel node occurs both by sight and with a handheld probe. 
The lymphatic drainage does not always match the classic anatomical pattern. Remember that if you're using isosulfan blue or lymphazurin, you have a risk of anaphylaxis. If you're using methylene blue, you have a risk of skin necrosis, and the blue dye is generally not approved for use in pregnancy, but you can use the uh, radiosulfur colloid technetium, which is a very low dose. The excision of the primary lesion should be performed at the same time as the sentinel node biopsy, although recent studies have shown no significant decrement in the ability to identify the sentinel node when mapping and biopsy are done after a previous wide local excision. Yes? We tend to do frozen sections of sentinel nodes when doing a breast cancer. I've heard from pathologists that they have no interest in doing frozen sections on sentinel nodes when they get melanoma. At this point in time, and, and, and uh, almost no one is doing frozen sections on sentinel nodes in breast cancer for uh, lumpectomies. Only at the time of mastectomy, at which point you might consider doing an axillary dissection. So many are not even doing it for breast cancer anymore, and we never did it for melanoma. We always waited and came back and did a full dissection because, and there's a reason for that, because we have a positive lymph node in melanoma, you're going to do a PET scan and look for systemic disease. And if they have systemic disease, you're not going to bother with going back and doing a, a nodal dissection if they have non-bulky disease. So we, we, we haven't ever pushed that envelope, nor have we ever really felt that was necessary. So who should get a sentinel node biopsy? Well, it's kind of controversial. The risk of nodal metastasis varies with tumor thickness. Less than 5% for tumors under a millimeter without ulceration. 20% for tumors 1 to 4 millimeters or 35% for tumors greater than 4. So the recommendation is that sentinel node biopsy should be discussed with all patients with invasive melanoma. However, patients with primary and melanomas greater than a millimeter are always appropriate for sentinel node biopsy, unless, of course, they have a palpable node or metastatic disease. Some patients with thinner melanomas, i.e. more than 0.75 but less than 1, may also be appropriate. They include people that have incomplete staging, meaning that they, sh they shave the biopsy and you're saying, I have a melanoma of 0.6 millimeters extending to the base of my excision. And is that melanoma 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or 1.6? I don't know. Uh, if it's ulcerated, if it's a Clark level 4, if there's evidence of significant regression because it may have been deeper and now I'm only picking up it after regression, if it's located on the trunk or if it has a high mitotic rate. And there's no generally accepted uh, rules for this, but most people wouldn't do a biopsy for a melanoma under 0.75 but would over 0.75, it was ulcerated, regressed, or had a high mitotic rate. Those are generally acceptable as the, as the criteria. Some of the others, the location on the trunk, a little softer indication. Patients with atypical lesions like uh, Spitz nevi or nevomelanocytic lesions may also be candidates for wider excision and sentinel no biopsy. So, what's the risk of ulceration? Well, if you look at ulcerated melanomas, they tend to behave like the category next highest. So, an ulcerated less than one millimeter behaves like a one to two millimeter. An ulcerated one to two millimeter behaves like a two to four. An ulcerated two to four behaves like a greater than four. Because when they ulcerate, just like when they regress, you're not getting a full measure of their depth because part of it ulcerated off and you're not getting a true measure. So we always tend to be a little bit more cautious with ulcerated and regressed melanomas. So what's adjuvant therapy in high-risk melanoma? Well, first we mentioned a completion lymph node dissection if the sentinel node is positive after a staging PET CT does not show metastatic disease. Currently, high dose interferon is the FDA approved adjuvant therapy for high risk melanoma, significantly prolonging relapse free survival. 
with a 26% reduction in risk and overall survival. Low dose therapy is less effective. However, none of the oncologists believed that study. And just as soon as your voyeur, ipilimumab, was FDA approved for adjuvant therapy, nobody gets melanoma, nobody gets interferon anymore. They all are put on uh, ipilimumab or Eurovoy, which is an anti-CL, a CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody. Uh, so many people never believed the interferon study, and all the oncologists were looking for a reason to avoid it because it's basically giving somebody the flu for an entire year. They just feel awful. So uh, it is approved therapy. You should know about it. But now also FDA approved is ipilimumab for the use in adjuvant therapy for anybody with a node positive or greater than three millimeter in depth melanoma. And you gave us a test question a little while ago. Correct. Right, because it is still correct, but it's not used. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give you the choice of using your voice. But what you should make, make note on this, which isn't on this slide, is that's for people with node positive disease or people with three millimeter or greater in depth melanomas are appropriate for adjuvant therapy. That's not listed here. But you should just make mention of it. Well, I always tend to overstage patients with ulcerated lesions. So I tend to, you know, if they're close, if they're 0.8 and they're ulcerated, I'm going to treat them if they're over, as if they're over 1. And I'm going to do a bigger margin. You don't, you don't strictly have to, but that's what I would do. Because you always think that they're going to be more advanced than, than what you're seeing. So can you say that anyone with ulceration would take a No, that's not correct for the board answer. The board answer doesn't take ulceration into effect when looking at the margin width. I'm telling you what to do in real life. The board answer is you look at that chart and you look at the depth and you make your decision. <coughs> so the treatment of recurrent and metastatic melanoma, you can use IL-2, hell of a treatment, they end up in the ICU, sick as a dog. Uh, decarbazine, which is a chemotherapy, temozolomide or temidar, which is the oral form of decarbazine. Decarbazine is also DTIC, and for those who are interested. Uh, and most people are being treated with some type of immunologic therapy, the most common of which is ipilimumab or Yervoy, which is an anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody stimulating the body's immune response to react against the melanoma. There's a 10 versus 6 month average increase in survival in stage 3 and 4, and remember that's what the FDA used to approve it, a 4 month improvement in survival. It blocks the inhibition of cytotoxic T cells. Immune-related toxicity from ipilimumab include colitis, rash, hepatitis, and inflammation. And remember, all of these monoclonal antibodies are costing somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars a month, and we're paying for it. So, the BRAF kinase inhibitors that include. Uh, Zelbaraf, Taflinar, and Mechanist, or vim, Vimurafenib, Dabrafenib, and Tramefenib all improve survival about 20% over uh, no therapy. But all of these, you need to test the melanoma for the BRAF V600E mutation. And just circle that and just remember that mutation. Because the, the, the BRAF V600E mutation, remember when we talked about colorectal cancer and we talked about looking at uh, KRAS and we talked about the fact that if you had a mutant KRAS, you couldn't get the, you couldn't get the drug, cetuximab. Well, in melanoma, you have to have the mutation in order to get the drug. So this only works in patients whose melanomas are BRAF V600E mutated, which is about 60%. So only melanomas that are BRAF V600E 
mutated can use the BRAF kinase inhibitors. And there's a, still a lot of controversy in metastatic disease. Do you use these first? Do you use these second? Do you use them in combination with your boy? And there are a lot of studies ongoing about that, so it's not likely you're going to be asked about it. Also new on the uh, horizon are the anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, nivulumab and, and pembrozilumab, which cause immune reaction to the melanoma, and they can be used in combination with ipilimumab, and these are the side effects that you can see. So we're moving on now to non-melanoma skin cancer. Which of the following is not true regarding non-melanoma skin cancer? Squamous cell carcinomas can occur in burn wounds and scars and chronically draining wounds. Both basal and squamous cell carcinomas are associated with UV exposure. Both squamous cell and basal cells are resistant to radiation therapy. Mohs surgery would be appropriate for a basal cell cancer of the face. Any negative surgical margin is sufficient for the treatment of squamous or basal cell cancer. So which one is not true? And the answer is C, both squamous and basal cells are resistant to radiation, and just quite the opposite, they're both very highly sensitive to radiation therapy. So, skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in the U.S., 40% of all cancers, more than 3.5 million, <coughs> excuse me, more than 3.5 million estimated cases in the U.S., 40 to 50% of Americans are affected, 95% curable with appropriate care. They're the highest risk in the highest areas of UV radiation, South Africa, Australia, and in U.S., the coastline from Florida through Texas and Louisiana have the highest rates of skin cancer. Basal cell cancers are the most common. They're 90% of all skin cancers, cancers that begin in the lowest layer of the skin. They rarely spread or metastasize, but there is a drug uh, that you need to know about. It's called Vismotajib or Erevej, which is approved for the unresectable or metastatic basal cell cancers. Basal cell cancers that are growing into areas that you can't surgically remove can be treated with this. It's a hedgehog pathway inhibitor. They typically develop in sun-exposed areas and may present as a sore that fails to heal. And here we see the typical uh, basal cell cancers, particularly this one with the central umbilication. And here we see some other basal cells. They typically involve the face, arms, and necks in sun-exposed areas. They're see being seen more and more in younger adults due to UV radiation and sun damage and people that have had frequent sunburns. Squamous cell cancer, one-fifth of all skin cancers, arise from sun-damaged skin. They rarely but can metastasize and spread, most commonly affecting the face, arms, and chest, and they're, they're very well noted to occur in old burn scars, draining wounds, chronically draining pyelonidal cysts, things like that. Anything where there's long-standing chronic inflammation uh, are at risk for the development of squamous, squamous cell cancers. And here we see some pictures of squamous cell cancers. And the treatment, and this is both for squamous and basal cell, is complete removal with a narrow margin, any negative margin. Curatage, particularly for basal cells, is often done by dermatologists, as is cryotherapy. Mohs surgery. Uh, is done for lesions in cosmetically sensitive areas, face, neck, and hands. And this is sequential tangential excision with on-site microscopic evaluation of the margins uh, as you're removing it. And radiation therapy is, in, is used for recurrent or inaccessible tumors. And you can also use topical chemotherapy ointments like Effudex.
And here's the, here's the Mohs surgery where you see that they're marking it out, they're making quadrants, they're inking the quadrants, and then they're sectioning them and looking at them under the microscope and then going back and serially excising them layer by layer in the areas where the tumors are positive. And this is really done for areas of cosmetic sensitivity, often delaying the reconstruction until after you get the final margin and final pathology back. Eccrine carcinoma or sweat gland cancers are rare. Uh, they, they, their varying names and types include sclerosing sweat duct carcinoma, porocarcinoma, malignant chondroid syringoma, malignant nodular hydradenoma or malignant eccrine spiradenoma. They're also associated with UV exposure. The treatment is wide excision, considered for sentinel node biopsy, possibly radiation therapy, and these have a very high rate of metastases and recurrence. Merkel cell tumors are also neuroendocrine carcinomas of the skin. They're rare tumors of the neural crest cell. They resemble small cell carcinoma of the lung under the microscope. There's about a 50 to 70% two-year survival. They can be associated with UV exposure, and the treatment is wide excision with sentinel node biopsy and then radiation to the local tumor bed. If the node is positive, then a radical node dissection of the involved nodal basin. Okay, we're moving on to sarcomas. Which of the following sarcomas is noted to spread to the regional lymphatics? Lyomyosarcoma, malignant fibrocystiocytoma, synovial sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, or gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And the correct answer is uh, synovial sarcoma, although no sarcomas frequently metastasize to the lymph nodes. Of those that do, synovial sarcoma is the one that does it the most, as we'll talk about. So soft tissue sarcoma is roughly 12,000 cases in the U.S. last year, leading to 5,000, roughly 5,000 deaths, 60% extremity, 20% retroperitoneum, 20% uh, trunk, I mean, 15% retroperitoneum, 9% head and neck. They tend to spread hematogenously. Rarely do they metastasize to the lymph node, but the ones that do include synovial sarcoma, epithelioid sarcoma, and angiosarcoma. Those are the ones that tend to spread to the lymph nodes when they spread to the lymph nodes. The risk factors for sarcoma include genetics, neurofibromatosis, Gardner syndrome, uh, tuberous sclerosis, or leaf from many. Long-term post-radiation exposure increases the risk of lymphangiosarcoma, particularly in patients with long-standing lymphedema. Uh, polyvinyl chloride, and then as we mentioned, long-standing lymphedema increases the, lift, the, list, the, the risk of lymphangiosarcoma, or Stewart-Treves syndrome. So most present as a painless lump. The radiologic evaluation usually involves an MRI of the affected extremity, plain x-rays, CAT scanning. If you're looking at the abdomen and pelvis, you want to do a CT of the chest to look for metastases. Diagnosis made by incisional or core biopsy overlying the area, looking at what the planned excision margin will be so that you don't violate the planes and you don't do anything that's going to inhibit your ability to do a complete resection. You want to orient the biopsy scar parallel to the long axis of the extremity or transversely across the trunk. And again, a core needle biopsy is an appropriate option as well. Prognostic indicators for, for sarcoma, grade is everything. The most important prognostic factor is what the grade is because low grade rarely metastasize and high grade almost always metastasize. So when you're looking at the TNM system, you only have two T's, T1 or T2, but grade is included 
in the prognostic indicators on the AJCC staging of melanoma. So you, melanoma, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not melanoma, sarcoma. The only tumor in which grade is included as part of the staging is sarcoma. So you have to know the grade because the grade is much more important even than the tumor size. When they metastasize, the extremity ones tend to go to the uh, lung, where the retroperitoneal tumors go to the liver. The treatment is complete surgical excision, ex excising all previous biopsy sites and all excisions. You do not want to shell it out because there's tumor present in the pseudocapsule. Wide excision with a two centimeter margin is preferable, which may include a muscle group excision, compartmental excision, or rarely an amputation reserved for recurrences and tumors that render the extremity useless. External beam or uh, brachytherapy radiation is used for intermediate and high grade tumors. Those tumors that have near or inadequate margin or when you're trying to do a limb sparing procedure and you have close margins around nerves or vascular structures or for areas of recurrence. And here's the typical picture of a liposarcoma of the shoulder being excised. And here we see uh, cath catheters left in place for brachytherapy for postoperative radiation. And this can be done with, again, external beam, intraoperative radiation, or with brachytherapy. Chemotherapy for sarcomas, they're generally chemosensitive. Isphosphamide response rates 20 to 50%, doxorubicin, decarbazine. There's no benefit to adjuvant therapy after complete resection, which is margin negative. Postoperative therapy may be benefit for those with positive margins or high-grade histology. And preoperative chemotherapy to augment limb salvage have demonstrated mixed results. Retroperitoneal sarcomas, 15% of all sarcomas, 1% of all cancers, often delayed diagnosis due to lack of symptoms. 50% are, are larger than 20 centimeters of diagnosis. And they typically are liposarcomas. They can be malignant fibrocystiocytomas or leiomyosarcomas. You want to rule out germ cell tumors, lymphomas, and other metastases. They're staged typically with a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. You want to assess for liver and lung metastases, assess for vascular invasion, and kidney function, particularly if it's involving the retroperitoneum and you have to sacrifice one kidney, you want to make certain that the other kidney is, is uh, normal anatomically and functioning. And here we see not the liver, but a large right-sided retroperitoneal liposarcoma. Complete surgical resection is the best treatment, but only achievable in about half the patients. Survival is significantly impacted if you can't impact, if you can't completely resect them. Overall, five-year survival about 50%. Often, uh, it involves radical extirpative procedures, bowel, kidney, or pancreas. Often, local recurrence is the problem, and chemotherapy and radiation is really controversial. And here's a picture of a large retroperitoneal liposarcoma. Recurrent or metastatic sarcomas, sarcomas that recur typically do so within five years. Extremities usually go to the pulmonary, to the lung, retroperitoneal, to the liver. And lung, uh, lung metastasis from uh, sarcoma was really the first site where metastectomy was done to show improved and long-term survival. And really, that was the, uh, that was the uh, initial uh, treatment of metastatic sarcoma to the lung was sort of, you know, lung resection, where they demonstrated that they could, do, could get long-term uh, survival. Uh, so that's still the appropriate treatment. Um, resection is preferred for isolated recurrence. Amputation, if it's an extremity. Pulmonary metastectomy, up to 40% five-year survival. Chemotherapy and radiation are generally palliative at best. So we're going to go on to talking for a few minutes about GIST, and it may be a little redundant, but they like to ask questions about it, so it's, it's a good review anyway. So which of the following factors would make you suspicious that a GIST tumor had a risk for recurrence? 
size over 10 centimeters, necrosis within the tumor, more than 10 mitoses per high-powered field, invasion of other organs, or all of the above. Very good. So at least you were paying attention during the last lecture. So these were previously classified as leiomyosarcomas. They can, they're symptomatic, usually late and often subtle. They can affect any portion of the GI tract, although most commonly they affect the stomach. Benign and malignant gists appear the same under the microscope, and all gists have malignant potential. So the high-risk features include size over 5 centimeters, high mitotic rate, necrosis, invasion, metastasis, or extra gastric location. And this is also the indication for the use of postoperative adjuvant Gleevec or imatinib uh, for any of these tumors. Uh, the diagnosis is by endoscopy or endoscopic ultrasound showing a submucosal tumor with ulceration. The biopsies are often non-diagnostic. They can bleed or ulcerate. They can obstruct. They can perforate. CT scanning is important, as well as uh, PET scanning. These are very PET avid. And complete surgical resection to clear margin is the uh, optimal therapy. And here we see a gist tumor of the greater curvature. If this, I'm sorry, of the lesser curvature. If this were a, uh, a, an adenocarcinoma, it would require a total gastrectomy. But for this, you can wedge out that area of the stomach and leave most of the stomach in place. GIST tumors arise from the interstitial cell of Cajal, which is a gastric pacemaker cell. They express CD117 or C-KIT, which is a growth factor receptor, also CD34. And the uh, survival depends on size and resectability, 75% for smaller tumors, 20 to 40% for malignancies. And imatinib or Gleevec is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor indicated for the adjuvant treatment for high-risk GIST. Metastatic locally advanced and incompletely re resected gist. 54% just demonstrate tumor reduction, 20% tumor stability, and prolonged adjuvant therapy up to three years uh, further reduces recurrence in high risk gist patients. 92 versus 81% five year survival, 66 versus 48% recurrence free survival. So the last uh, few slides are going to be on oncology in general, I'm talking about some general topics in oncology. This is the DNA cycle, uh, the cycle of mitosis from G0 resting, G1 post-mitotic S phase with the DNA synthesis, G2 pre-mitotic M is mitosis, and the cell cycle is one generation. And here you can see the different cycles. And that's important to know because you want to know where your chemotherapy drugs act within the cell cycle in order to determine how best to treat them. So the antibiotics and antimetabolites work in this area here. The alkylating agents work for the whole cell cycle, the vinca alkaloids, the mitotic inhibitors, and the taxanes. So the antimetabolites are cytotoxic and S phase alkylators in all phases, mitotic inhibitors, and spindle cell poisons in the M phase, and the topoisomerase inhibitors, like the anthracyclines and the campothecans, uh, are also cytotoxic. Uh, and then you have targeted therapy, which is designed to hit a specific event or a specific receptor, including anti-hormone therapy, antibody therapy, angiogenic therapy, and interferon. So talk a little bit about chemotherapy. Which of the following tumors may be amenable to neoadjuvant therapy? Rectal adenocarcinoma, esophageal adenocarcinoma, esophageal squamous cell cancer, ductal carcinoma of the breast, or all of the above? And the answer is yes, all of the above. So I just wanted to list for you some of the more common chemotherapy drugs associated with the certain cancers that we treat. So for breast cancer, the most common today would be a combination of adriamycin and cytoxan plus or minus a taxane. 
with the addition of Herceptin if they're HER2 positive, Pergeta or Pertuzumab if they're an eoadjuvant or metastatic, and then Tamoxifen or Aromatase inhibitor if they're ER and or PR positive. For colorectal cancer, adjuvant Folfox for stage 3 and limited stage 2 cancer, some stage 2s. Folfiri is also used, Arintotecan or Zelox or Zelota, which is oral 5-FU. And again, adding either Bevacizumab or Cetuximab for recurrent or metastatic disease, Cetuximab if they're KRAS wild type. Pancreas, generally using gemcitabine. Stomach, we're using a combination of ECF, eberubicin, platinum, and 5-FU, or Folfox. Melanoma, we mentioned interferon, zelbaraflin, urovoy, and for GIST tumors, Gleevec. Just a handy note to, to kind of review at some point about which drugs match up with which tumors. Talk a little bit about radiation therapy. When you're talking about radiation therapy, radiation is using ionizing radiation, targeting a human being, and it works by uh, accelerating electrons to high energy and then disrupting the DNA of the tumor. Radiation is measured in gray, which used to be rad. So a capital G gray is, ex is equivalent to a capital RAD, R-A-D. A small G gray or centigrade is into the old milli-RAD. Remember that radiation is dose time. So what people don't necessarily realize is that the time interval of treating a tumor and the dose that you're giving, even though the exact number may be the same, is different biological effects. So if you're giving 5,000 centigrade, 1,000 a day for five days, or you're giving 100 a day for 50 days, although the end result is 5,000, the biological result is very different. And the one that's given 1,000 a day for five days has a very much greater biological effect than 100 a day for 50 days. So it's dose over time that's important. The bigger the dose, the shorter the interval, the greater the biologic effect by a lot. So patients who get a higher dose over a shorter course end up getting a much greater biological effect of their radiation. And that's something that isn't commonly known, and the radiation therapists don't make a point of that, but they also have a higher toxicity because you're giving a higher dose in a shorter fraction of time. The typical dose per day for external beam radiation is between 180 and 300 centigrade. Lower daily fractions tend to have longer, lower long-term toxicity for normal tissue. And the radiation effective dose is determined by the, by the dose in centigrade over the time interval given. So this is the linear accelerator, the typical uh, one that's used for external beam radiation. This is the brachytherapy machine. And the way that ionizing radiation works is by breaking the DNA and, and, and really taking advantage of the fact that tumor DNA repair is inferior and slower than normal tissues DNA repair. So you're going on the basis that the, the repair of the DNA in normal tissue occurs at a quicker rate than tumor. And that's how the radiation therapy is effective. And remember that cancers don't grow on the weekends. If your kids want to go into a medical field, radiation therapy is a wonderful field because cancers only grow Monday to Friday and never on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> so in external beam radiation, over 90% of the patients are treated with megavoltage x-rays uh, or photons. Superficial tumors can be treated with electrons by the same linear accelerator, and proton therapy is available in special facilities Protons are charged weighted particles as opposed to electrons and photons, which have negligible mass. And that's protons drop their dose in a more confined area. And proton radiation is generally still experimental. Really, the only indication for proton therapy is children with brain tumors. 
That's really the only absolute indication, although they're plugging it on TV for prostate cancer all over the place. It does have a more confined dose. It does have a much better track record, but it's also significantly more expensive and generally not covered by many of the insurances. So normal tissues are able to repair damage from ionizing radiation. Uh, the total toxicity uh, to kidney and liver, 18 and 30 gray respectively, spinal cord and small bowel, 45 gray, which is why you hear things like IMRT, image modulated radiation, IGRT, cyber knife, gamma knife, all of these techniques are treating the tumor from various locations so as not to summate on the normal tissue and reduce normal tissue toxicity. They're all based on treating or in a circumferential way to summate in the area of the tumor and reduce the dose of radiation to normal tissue. And some of the complications of radiation therapy that we see, proctitis, enteritis, osteonecrosis, pneumonitis, and cystitis. What are the principles of surgical oncology? Well, we want to remove all tumor with negative margin to orient the specimen multidisciplinary treatment planning, neoadjuvant therapy, as we mentioned, for esophageal, rectal, some breast, and lung cancer, uh, the management of obstruction in the face of cancer, frequent with ovarian, peritoneal, and GI cancers. About a third to half of those with a cancer history will have an adhesive obstruction rather than a cancerous obstruction. Diagnostic studies may not reveal the cause or the level of the obstruction, and sometimes operation is indicated, perhaps doing a bypass rather than an or an ostomy rather than an anastomosis or a drainage peg. For large bowel obstruction, primary colorectal cancer versus metastasis, right-sided lesions can be resected. With primary anastomosis, left-sided lesions, consider an ostomy or a stent. Esophageal obstruction, dilatation, stenting, sometimes palliative chemotherapy and RT, rarely surgical esophagostomy. Biliary obstruction, pancreatic or hepatobiliary malignancies, typically ERCP or stenting, or PTC with drainage. If you're going to do a surgical bypass, do it to the common duct rather than the gallbladder. And if it's metastatic, you really want to just stent them. Debulking of, of tumors is useful in a very small select group of tumors. Those in where it, it, there's an adjunct to improve chemotherapy or radiation or prevent or treat obstruction, bleeding, and perforation, control ascites or symptom control. And really, uh, debulking has only been useful in ovarian cancer, primary peritoneal cancer, some of the endocrine or neuroendocrine tumors, pseudomyxoma peritonei, or appendiceal carcinoma with mucinous transformation. And we talked about the uh, treatment of hepatic metastases in the prior hour. HIPEC or hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy is indicated for carcinomatosis from pseudomyxoma peritonei, appendiceal cancer, and to a lesser extent, colon, gastric, uh, melanoma, a uh, correction, peritoneal mesothelioma or sarcomas. This is the use of hyperthermic intraperitoneal therapy using mitomycin C, heating the, uh, the, uh, the juice up to about 42 degrees Celsius and doing a 90-minute bath in the peritoneal cavity. Uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis is a common form of tumor recurrence, usually remains localized in the peritoneal cavity for a period of time, uh, usually accompanied by malignant dyscites and uh, often can be managed by the use of, of, of uh, HIPEC in the right case. So the HIPEC, you do a laparoscopy, you do a laparotomy, you debulk all tumors, strip the diaphragms, consider splenectomy, hyperthermic intraperitoneal installation of mitomycin C, and then creating anastomosis if necessary after that. Uh, it's done in the OR. Uh, it's, uh, you have inflow and outflow cannulas. It's you using a machine similar to a cardiac bypass machine. And here you see a patient undergoing a high pec. Here you see inflow and outflow temperature probes to measure the temperature of the inflow and the outflow uh, chemotherapy. Survivability, uh, five-year survival, 
50 to 90 percent in patients with mucinous appendiceal tumors, less so for some of the other tumors. And here we have just some of the uh, studies on HIPEC. The use of laparoscopy and robotics in surgical oncology can be used for biopsies, resections, assessment of resectability, and therapeutic laparoscopy for things such as bypasses, RFA, et cetera. And that's all I have. Again, I want to wish everybody here the best of luck. I know you will all pass and, and make me very proud. So thank you very much for sharing some time with me today.